This is the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, March 4th, 2021. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Galagos. Here. Trustee Hannon. Here. Trustee Giza. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. President Sells. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Molina. Here. Also present Village Clerk Haley. Very much, Mr. Molina. Do you want to do our litany? Yes. Thank you, President Sells. So we are here doing our regular Village Board meeting virtually, and that is conditioned on there being a gubernatorial emergency declaration, which there is, and a determination by the Village President that meeting in person uh, fully under the Open Meetings Act is uh, either not practical uh, or completely safe, and he has made both of those determinations. And so the base, the conditions have been met for us to meet virtually. Uh, via Zoom, and uh, that is what we are doing. So the protocols have been met and we can proceed. Thank you very much. So we're gonna uh, try to return to our normal process tonight of uh, reciting the pledge. So if everyone would like to unmute uh, and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America. and to the Republic, and to the Republic. One nation, one nation, visible, under God, God justice, justice. That kind of worked. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll move on now uh, to presentations and public comment. Do we have anyone interested in giving public comment this evening? Director Johns, do you know? Nobody in the waiting room. Okay, hearing none, we'll move on then to <clears throat> reports of village officers. First up is the, the, the president's report. And I just, I just wanted to share a, a fact with, with the board and also with our residents that, that I just learned this past week. I, I asked Director Johns and Manager Francis to pull together a, uh, a compilation of the, the grants that the village has been awarded in the last eight years. Uh, this is strictly through the, the initiative uh, undirected of, of our village staff. And in the last eight years, uh, Riverside has been awarded $14,150,445 in grants. Um, and that's all thanks to the hard work of, of our, our staff. And that all would have come out of taxpayer money if they had not been able to achieve that remarkable goal. So thank you, uh, Director Johns and Manager Francis and to all of our department heads who work so hard to, to do what they can to lessen the financial burden on our residents. We really appreciate it. And that is all I have this evening, uh, Manager Francis. Thank you, President Sells. Um, my report this evening is a little long. So if the residents and the board would bear with me as I go through this. Um, there are two items that I would like to touch upon uh, regarding village staffing this evening, both with regard to the police department and also community development and administration areas. Since the announcement of Chief Weitzel's retirement, I've received a lot of inquiries about the next police chief. After careful consideration, I would like to announce the creation of a new position, Director of Public Safety and Emergency Management. The individual serving in this role will serve as chief for both the police and the fire department. Effective May 1st, 2021, Chief Buckley will be assuming this role. Chief Buckley has resided in Riverside for over 50 years and has extensive knowledge and experience in public safety. The transition will begin prior to Chief Weitzel's retirement to allow Chief Buckley ample time to be apprised on all police matters. I am certain this will be a seamless transition. While Chief Buckley is very accomplished in fire service, he is equally as accomplished in law enforcement as the retired deputy police chief for the village of Lyons. He was hired as a police officer for Lyons in 1998 and retired in May, 2019. 
During his time, he held the positions of police officer, sergeant, and deputy chief. Chief Buckley attended Northwestern University Center for Public Safety School of Staff, Police Staff and Command. He was also the assistant team commander for Northern Illinois Police Alarm System from 2004 to 2018. Chief Buckley has expressed that he is excited to be the village's first director of public safety and emergency management. The other item I wanted to report on this evening is the reorganization due to vacancies within the community development department and what the organization structure within the village will look like. We will be eliminating the position of community development director and creating the position of assistant village manager. The assistant village manager will supervise the operations of community development and also building department activities. Um, within that area, we will have a planner, which will be a new position, building inspector, plumbing inspector, electrical inspector, code enforcement, which will be um, an additional community service officer to assist in those activities. Um, also will be the village clerk executive assistant and our management analyst who currently is under community development. And this analyst will start to learn more generalist and assist in the various departments with various special projects and activities. Additionally, we will be looking to hire two additional interns to assist in special projects, village minutes, and other related activities. Also assisting us with streamlining some of our processes doing forms, helping with our document management system that we will be implementing um, in addition to other various tasks and activities. And we will also begin to uh, evaluate and research um, whether it's a media relations consultant or a part-time employee to handle media relations and community communications for the village. Um, as we become more active in social media, that's a very important piece and we wanna make sure that we're engaging the community in that respect. Um, so you will be seeing postings um, for assistant village manager, planner, and also the part-time um, community service officer. Um, there will be some additional training, cross training that will be done over the next year. Um, but this is a multifaceted plan, um, whereas implementation will occur over time. And we're very excited. In addition to that, we'll be hiring an officer not only to fill the vacancy that was created when we had Officer Mahana leave the village um, in the fall of last year, but also the additional vacancy that's being created by Chief Weitzel's retirement. So we will have two new officers, hopefully beginning um, in 2021. That is my update as it relates to the reorganization. The reorganization is anticipated to save the village approximately $150,000 to $200,000 per year beginning in 2022. Um, if all things considered with our status quo currently remain the same. Um, so it's exciting. These are opportunities then where those funds can be reinvested in much needed capital based on our capital plan that we've outlined previously. So it is a great opportunity. Also, it will provide some needed um, additional assistance for department heads and other staff members who have taken on more and more in recent years. That is my report on that. those items. One final piece I wanted to give the board an update on. After speaking with um, President Sells following our last board meeting, um, we had the discussion regarding the capital planning and the debt structures for the water and sewer system. We will, with President Sell's permission, have it on an upcoming agenda. 
After speaking with him, there is nothing within the plan that obligates the future board to continue with it. It just gives them very good framework for discussion for our CIP planning. Um, and so having a board that is as knowledgeable as the current board to begin that framework will be helpful in facilitating the master plan of funding um, with debt schedules and uh, recommended fee setup and things of that sort. So we will have, we will continue with the water and sewer um, as planned and then we will move through the other funds. We probably will not make it through all of our capital before the transition of the board, um, but President Sells and I felt very strongly that this is an important project and to get as much accomplished as we can before the transition of the board. That is all I have, thank you, sir. Thank you. I, I just want to talk a little bit about what you just heard. Uh, this all this reorganization opportunity came about because of vacancies we vacancies we had in the in the building department, the community development department. And I suggested to Manager Francis that this might be a good opportunity to to rethink that department and see if there isn't a better way to do it to provide a higher level of service. And not surprisingly, she came back with an entire reorganization of the entire village administration. Um, and she kind of passed over it there at the end. I mean, what, what she and her staff have done in this reorganization have basically created a funding source, an ongoing funding source for our capital improvement projects, uh, which we did not have prior to this plan. So that $150,000 to $200,000 a year is extremely important to this village. And, it's, uh, and it was through the, the uh, ingenuity and creativity and skill uh, led by Manager Francis that this was accomplished. So uh, we all owe her and her staff a, a big round of thanks. Uh, they really have made a major contribution to the future of this village and uh, we greatly appreciate it. Kind of in keeping with that $14 million in grants that they got, so is just some idea of the caliber of, of people we have working on, on behalf of our residents. Uh, moving on now to the approval of the consent agenda. On the agenda this evening is approve the voucher list of bills for March 4, 2021. Approve the Village Board of Trustees regular meeting minutes of February 18, 2021. Review and file the historical commission meeting minutes of January 25th, 2021 the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting minutes of December 21st, 2020, and the Community Development Department 2020 annual report. And lastly, a resolution authorizing the sale or disposal of personal property owned by the Village of Riverside. Does anyone need anything removed for discussion? Hearing none, I'd ask for a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Motion by Mr. Gallegos. Second. Second by Ms. Collins. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion, motion carries. Next up, uh, reports of departments, commissions, and trustee liaisons. Are there any liaison reports this evening? Seeing none, we'll move on to departments. And what we have uh, tonight is an update on preliminary 2020 crime statistics. Chief Weitzel. Good evening, President Sells, trustees, and Manager Francis. So in your packet is my annual preliminary crime index report required by us to report to the state police and then the state police report that onto the FBI for inclusion in the national report. As you can see, statistically, our crime is up 18.2%. And this board probably knows over the last four to five years that the crime trend has been going down. This is a very unusual year because of the pandemic to say the least. But even overall, our crime is very low. And like I tell the board every year, whether it's, it's a positive, the crime is trending down statistically or up. Small communities like Riverside with a small population and really small reduced crime any fluctuation in those numbers are going to, the percentages are going to look more alarming than they actually are. We really only have 117 reportable crimes for the entire year, 12 months. And that represented 18 more reportable crimes than in 2019. 
So I would caution everyone to say that this ex extremely safe community, statistically it will say 18%, but overall our crime is very low. And you will look at the crime stats, historically Riverside's number one crime index column is always property crime, whether that be burglary or theft. This year, once again, theft led the uh, categories. And I would note that almost 40% of those thefts were from motor vehicles and those motor vehicles were not locked. The entire year, we only had four cars that were physically broken into, either their windows were smashed by uh, maybe a baseball bat or a landscape rock. The other ones were cars that were, while they weren't left open, they were left unlocked and uh, just items were taken. So I, I think the crime is, is spiked a little bit, but I would say it just spiked a little bit. And um, I think you might see that throughout the nation, just a little bit of spiking. So, and, and, and you also read my report, you'll see that the preliminary patrol activity is down and every single category is down. And I wrote a pretty lengthy memo with this crime report to let you know that really that might've even been our objective. Now, while we didn't start the year out saying I want officers to have less self-initiated activity or issue less citations or less arrests, we, when the pandemic hit in late March, we made a conscious decision to limit the officer's contact with the public to any extent we could. For a small agency like Riverside, if we had had a large outbreak of COVID-19 in my department, it would have been devastating. And we already had in officers who either thought they had COVID-19 or had maybe had contracted it. But when you just take one or two employees, when I have only maybe three employees working a shift, it would have been devastating. So we kind of made the decision to stop the traffic grants during the pandemic, to slow down traffic enforcement, to only going after impaired drivers or really egregious violators. We didn't have officers go into homes. We had officers meet people in the street, sidewalk, lobby of our police station, and more likely on the telephone for probably a good six months when possible. So the self-initiated activity obviously went down. It is already starting to trend up in, in uh, February and March, and that's that officers are getting more comfortable. And I am issuing directives or rescinding directives that I issued on certain protocols that we did not want them to engage in, if possible. Because my number one goal at the end of the day was that you as residents and our residents, when they called the police department or they called 911, that we had officers to answer their calls. I, th I thought that was the the overriding concern is that our residents felt comfortable, the police would be there with the proper staffing when you needed us. And I think we accomplished that for the year, uh, at least for year 2020. And I am also proud that on the last page, I, I put a chart together of what I would consider more of the major, maybe property crimes and other crimes we had. And out of those lists that's on there, only one crime is uh, currently not solved and that is the home invasion on Lionel. And the detectives are still working on that. As, as I speak to the board tonight. And it, some of those crimes were um, solved specifically with the street camera program that this board approved and funded and continues to fund for 2021. So I just wanted to make sure that the board and our residents had an update, had an explanation as to why the crime is trending up a small um, percentage in my opinion, and also why our self-initiated activity is down. And um, I would be happy to answer any questions that the president or board would have, if there are any. Trustees, any questions for Chief Weitzel? Mr. Hannon? Chief, first of all, great report. It was, it was the statistics were, you know, as you noted, a little misleading, given the small numbers involved, that it's really an 18 event jump um, or smaller than that. But, you know, now that we have, COVID vaccines, and I'm assuming that most of the force is, is vaccinated. Is there going to be initiative to sort of go back to pre-COVID with more uh, proactive uh, self-initiated stops and, and, and uh, traffic enforcement? Yeah, absolutely. So I've already reinstituted the traffic grant. So we received the IDOT traffic grant that I suspended. They left that money for us to use. It's been carried over to 2021. So we do have over $20,000 in grant money available. That'll start up. The officers have been told to start 
of just normal traffic enforcement. And you are correct. Almost out of my 19 employees up to me, all the way up to the chief of police, I think 17 of us are vaccinated already. And, um, and there is some civilian staff. So I do believe they feel more comfortable and you will see a much more professionally aggressive, uh, especially traffic enforcement. And I say that because our residents still email me and they still contact me about cars blowing stop signs or they would like to see more enforcement on their block. So that is going to start up again and it actually has within the last couple of weeks. Anything else for Chief Weitzel? Ms. Collins? I was just wondering, some of the modifications that you mentioned in your memo that you had made, are any of those did they work so well that this is something that you would change long term or is everything going back to the way that it was? You know what I mean? Was this an opportunity to see if there were maybe some ways that things could be changed? Yeah, certainly the the taking some of the phone call reports that were delayed, like somebody wanted to report their bicycle stolen, and like maybe they went out of town and they came back five days later and their bicycle was stolen from the side of the garage. You know, those types of, many police agencies are already moving to putting those reports online permanently on their websites or some larger suburban departments even have kiosks that are available in their lobby. Mm -hmm. And and we did, we made one uh, really big adjustment is my officers didn't go in on uh, ambulance calls with the fire department and that was taken under review actually with the fire chief, I got advice from him on what we should do on that. And just limiting some of that contact that we would have unless there was a crime taking place or we needed to do a death investigation. But, you know, I can see with our, to be honest, with our consolidated dispatching and what's happening as, as the manager just talked about and the reshaping of even village staff here, I think a lot of what we're learning during this pandemic for combining services uh, um, putting our, our departments together that we can share responsibilities across, you know, get, a, get rid of some of those little um, territorial stuff we used to have. I think there's, there is going to be more opportunity going um, forward. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems like a good chance uh, because we did have to pull back on some things to reevaluate whether or not they need to be done. And actually um, the one that you mentioned of them going into the home during the ambulance calls was exactly one that I was thinking of as well. Yeah, I had direct input with that decision making from the fire chief. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Chief Weitzel, we appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we have no ordinances and resolutions this evening, so we'll move on to considerations and we have a discussion of a the Swan Pond Path Budget Amendment. Uh, Director Tab? Yes, thank you. So on February 18th, the board discussed um, the shoreline stabilization and the need for it. And ultimately the board decided to go with uh, limestone ledge rock. And the cost of limestone ledge rock was $125,000. So here we are, um, you know, obviously that wasn't budgeted for, so we have to figure out how we're gonna pay for it. And we came up with three options. One would be the utilization of the Irma resources or the reserves. The other one would be to prioritize the capital projects for 2021. And last would be a waiting for the audit to uh, finish up and see if there would be existing funds in the balance. So your packet, um, actually I believe it's the last page. So in addition to this, we took the opportunity because we're using the limestone ledge rock to incorporate a canoe launch now, this canoe launch has been discussed for uh, a few years now, is my understanding. So because of the limestone ledge rock and its orientation, it seemed like a natural fit to try to incorporate something using a thinner limestone ledge. Um, you know, we're anticipating it to be about um, 10 feet wide, excuse me, 10 feet wide. And the cost for this would be an additional $5,000 and which um, and the scope of the project is a, a minimal amount for uh, the benefit that we would be providing for access to the river and possible, um, you know, whether canoes or kayaks. So we kind of have two things here. Um, one would be if we're looking for, uh, you know, 
feedback from the board on if you would like to see a canoe or kayak launch incorporated into this plan for a cost of $5,000. Uh, you know, as you can see from the picture, it, it's similar to what we were looking, uh, similar to some of the limestone ledge rock photos that you saw last board meeting. Uh, just the step is shortened somewhat to make it easier to get down to the water line. So there's there's that we're looking for feedback on, and then the the funding source for this 125,000 plus the 5,000. Now there's uh, of course the 30,000 that was discussed for the permeable paver ribbon. Uh, since then we have received some feedback um, from our state representative uh, with the opinion that we may not need to go uh, with this permeable uh, ribbon route. Uh, it seems like we will be able to uh, continue with our exposed aggregate sidewalk without this permeable facet to it. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're probably looking at 125,000 if the board elects to go with the, the canoe launch for 5,000. We're at 130,000 of additional uh, expenses on top of the original $475,000 that. Mm -hmm. with. So of the three sources, um, we're seeking some direction from the board as to which uh, route you would like to uh, have staff move towards. If anyone has any questions or opinions on that, I'd be happy to hear them. So why don't we, why don't we take that last point first in terms of the, the funding mechanism? Um, looking at the three options, it uh, seems to me that the third one is the most prudent at this point uh, to see where we're actually going to end up and whether we can pay for it out of existing funding. But um, what do you think, trustees? I, I, I have a question on the, the law. First of all, the launch looks amazing and that's what the river is meant for. So I think it's really neat. Question is though, I've got a place up in, uh, up in Union Pier and are those is, are those thinner pieces of limestone? Are those are those attached to each other? Are they like grouted together? Yeah, there would be there, there would be a, water. They're pretty small. The ones that up at my beach house. And these people are spending a half million bucks to put these massive boulders down. And even those things right. push around. So yeah, the uh, the smaller thinner pieces would be mortared to the larger ones. Mortared. Yeah, there would be a, um, whether it's a it probably wouldn't be a typical mortar. Because that the freeze thaw cycle would affect that. It would be probably a polymer infused mortar, which makes it a little more um, gives it a little more strength and uh, adherence for the, the. You know, it's probably a, a landscaping type product. That, yeah, it's beautiful. That that launch looks beautiful. It's really natural. The thought is, you know, I, we don't have a map in here, but the thought is to uh, the last board of me saw three kind of sections that would be getting this limestone treatment and the launch, um, the intent is to put it on that northernmost one, which would be the closest to the roadway. Uh, so you don't have to carry a kayak canoe to the southernmost section that would have the limestone. And then we also didn't want it to uh, put it or incorporate it in the middle section, which is next to the outfall there. So we're gonna stick it as far north as possible, uh, the closest to the roadway. Nice. So let's let's uh, circle back to the funding source question first, Ms. Collins. My preference would be in the reverse order of what you um, suggested. So Irma funds, I always think should be our last resort and I would like to see us never touch those. Um, and so as Ben said, I think that if we could just see what happens first, maybe we don't have to worry about it. Maybe it will come out of current funds and if not to reevaluate other projects. Other thoughts on the funding, Mr. Paula? I, I have a question on the funding. So timing wise, uh, does it matter? Does the funding source affect the timing of the project? The, well, that'd be probably a, a director John's question to answer that. I I don't believe it affects the timing of this project. However, if the intent of the board was to reprioritize other projects, we would want to make sure that we present that 
sooner rather than later to the boards as to not move forward on other projects. So, so let me be a little bit more explicit. So, um, I, th I think it's between the Irma funds and, and waiting for the audit and uh, seeing if, if we come up with extra money there. Um, if we committed to do Irma funds, is that a project that we, I'm assuming the audit's not going to be done until um, fall or, or winter? It's, it'll be done in May. Oh, this is the audit for 2020. Correct. I get it. Okay, I'm sorry. I was thinking 2021. So I, I suppose if, if the timing, if it doesn't affect the timing, I'm fine waiting, seeing what the audit produces. And if there's money, then uh, maybe it's less that we have to take from Irma at that point, or maybe we don't have to take from Irma at all. But um, in the end, I'm fine taking some of the money from Irma uh, and applying it toward this project. But I also uh, don't mind waiting for the uh, audit in May or June or whenever. So really it's just a housekeeping item, the taking the Irma funds or not. We can even wait till the end of the year because we have sufficient cash on hand to be able to pay um, for these different expenses. It's more of, we need to make sure we make some decisions before December 31st, 2021 essentially, just to clarify, sorry about that. Yeah, given that, I would suggest we, we proceed as quickly as we can and then make that decision after the audit as to uh, whether we need to tap our funds or if we have the cash on hand. I have a question. <clears throat> um, so, it's such a, it's a small amount of money compared to um, some of our other some of our other projects, um, and I'm not familiar with the like commonly what results from the audit. But is there a good chance that in the audit we would reveal five thousand dollars? Pretty is it pretty normal to come up with a few thousand in the audit? I believe we are going to have some surplus from 2020. Just the amount of that surplus is yet to be determined in the general fund. And if I may, President Sells, the concern isn't the, the 5,000. The 5,000 is a simple amount to um, absorb. It's the 125. Okay. That's the additional the change order. So it sounds, Mr. Mr. Calgos. I would be fine until we wait until the uh, audit is, is completed as well. Mr. Hannon? Yeah, I just want to reiterate um, what Trustee Collins said and wholeheartedly agree with that. I view the IRMA funds as the ultimate rainy day fund and think that, you know, tapping into IRMA, um, you know, really needs to be given grave consideration and in, 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 you know, in my mind, it's, you know, the, the last dollars need to be sent. Where do we find them? I, I just don't want to tap into that uh, as a resource uh, with any sense of regularity. Great. Okay, so it sounds like we have a consensus on the funding source. I, Ms. Francis? Just to be clear, then, we're going to bid it out with because we have to start that process. So we'll bid out the project with the limestone, um, understanding that there it will be over what we initially budgeted for and include the canoe launch. Yes, but I, I have a couple questions about the canoe launch. Okay. Um, so for a while now, the, the Parks and Recreation Department have, have tossed around an idea of, of having a, a floating uh, canoe dock, you know, kayak dock. Um, and they, they had been thinking about putting it at the bottom of the hill beside the library, beside where that, I assume that's an outflow that's over there. Is, is that where you're thinking about putting this? Or are you thinking more in the corner of, of where the, the two walls meet? Yeah, this would be more in the western corner, uh, west of the library. In that northwest corner, as you come down the hill in the Swan Pond on the path currently, the first deteriorated section where it's kind of washed out 
where the limestone uh, would be in place, that's the proposed site for this. So is it conceivable to incorporate this, this floating dock idea uh, along with the, the, the launch site? But the, I mean, the thought that Parks and Rec has had in the past is it would be an, an opportunity for someone you know, to kayak down, have their, their you know, canoe or kayak secured, you know, go into town and have lunch or something like that, then come back and continue their, their trip. So, uh, and I, it, it seems that the, the way this is designed doesn't really lend itself to that. So would, would there be a way to incorporate some kind of dockage in along with this? You are, yeah, you're correct in the sense that this is not a dock. This is a, an entry point to the river that um, eases the access by, you know, if you're carrying a canoe or a kayak. Um, it's, it, you really can't dock at it. Um, from a floating dock standpoint, you know, you have to secure it to some kind of foundation on shore. Um, it would be removed, uh, obviously, as the river begins to ice up. The length of it would be dictated on the water level adjacent to the shoreline. So in theory, a dock could be mounted to something, but I wouldn't be mounting it to limestone rock. It would be a poured uh, concrete footing that you would adhere to. Um, and of course it would be hinged on pins. So it can adjust to your, the water level essentially. Uh, it would probably have to be a multi-deck hinged dock to accommodate the water level. And then the point at which it's hinged would have to be thought out due to the amount of flooding. Um, and honestly, it would probably have to be removed if we foresaw the river getting to a certain elevation just to avoid damage. So the, some thought would have to be put into that. I'm not familiar with the, the floating dock that they, the rec department was referring to. But um, it has a couple more facets you have to think about as, as far as installing one of those. This, you know, this would be more so just a, an ease of entrance to the river and getting out and so forth. You know, it's, it's definitely not a dock or a, uh, somewhere to dock your boat. Mr. Galicus? Um, yeah, I would concur with what Director Hebb uh, just said. Um, the uh, launching pad we're looking to do is a lot like what they have in Lyons at the Sony Ford. Um, it does enable people to come up and, and down into, into the water at the zero depth entry level. Uh, the floating pad is going to be a lot of maintenance and be a lot more man hours to, to watch in case we do have flood issues uh, going down on there. Um, it, it would be a lot more work than, than, than by one to give it at this point. Yeah, just one more thing, just in my experience also, putting it where, where Director Tab's thinking about putting it, a lot of times you'll see people where they have the, the wheels on the back of their canoes or kayaks and they're walking with it. So using that walk with that driveway down, that hill down the, 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 the asphalt would, would probably be a better location. I, and I agree with Director Tab, putting the floating thing there, I think it'd be a little bit of a nuisance. And usually when you pull your kayak out, you're just gonna let it sit there on the ground, I'm assuming, rather than let it float in the water. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing, one thing we have to think about, um, not to interrupt or anything, but uh, the river contains a lot of debris. Uh, you know, at any point you can see a whole tree floating down the river. So to install a, uh, a very expensive floating dock, I can't imagine they're cheap, and have it taken out by a, a tree uh, would be somewhat disheartening. So um, yeah, I don't know. It might be more addressed for like a like a lake or a pond or something like that. I don't know, um, especially the the bend in that river because at nineties at that point, a lot of that debris that doesn't make that immediate hard turn floats into that bay, and uh, occasionally goes up against that shoreline. So, mm -hmm. so kind of a catch all. Ms. Collins. I was just gonna say though, what we are talking about doing would not preclude having that. That would just be a different discussion, correct? Right. Yeah, so. Yeah, because I, the, the, like I say, the, the area that Parks and Rec has, has talked about is there is only, it's at the bottom of the hill by the library. And you know, I, I take what Director Tab 
says uh, about the, the debris, but um, you know, I mean, I fish down there quite a bit and that, that area where they're talking about really doesn't get much of that because there's like a back eddy there. Um, and, and really the, the debris is carried more in that central current. So um, yeah, I think, but I think what Ms. Collins said is exactly right. It may, it may well be that if, if down the road, uh, Parks and Rec wants to propose something like this in that other location, it wouldn't have any impact on the launch site. I saw another hand, Mr. Hannon. Yeah, President Sells, I, first of all, I, I'm very excited about the canoe launch concept. Um, I know we've talked about this. We've, we've looked at the canoe launch in Lions. Um, just wanna make sure that from a traffic and parking point of view, um, I, I sort of harken back to when we had our tremendous snow, uh, we had a lot of cars parked uh, along that route, uh, a couple issues with people parking in, in what would have been an emergency lane. Uh, for some reason, people were reluctant to use the commuter lot uh, to park. And I'm just you know wondering if we've done any sort of uh, due diligence on how having what will become hopefully a very popular new launch and its impact on um, parking availability, street flow. You know, the second question is, um, you know, is there any going to be any sort of limitation on, um, you know, commercial use of, of the launch tours, you know, launching from there from Riverside where you have a group of six canoes, they come with a van and towing the canoes and, you know, all of a sudden we have that sort of commercial traffic um, in what's supposed to be a, you know, place, place of uh, nature. And just want to make sure that as we talk about this canoe launch, we, um, you know, have, have thought through how that changes the use of that path. And are we, are we ready for it as far as a parking and, and you know, potential crowd and, and commercial use point of view. Those are excellent points. I don't know that that has been considered, quite frankly. Um, and maybe that's something that uh, we need to look, certainly the parking issue. And maybe, you know, I mean, just off the top of my head, maybe we can have something where uh, the commercial usage, like you're speaking of, they have to be permitted by the Parks and Rec Department or something like that. But yeah, I, I think those are two very valid points that we need to consider. Any thoughts on that, Mr. Gallagos? Um, yeah, like let's say like REI, for example, they tend to have a commercial activity on lakes and not really on rivers so that the um, craft can come back uh, without having transportation. That's the preferred way that they like to have their operations done. So I'm really not um, so concerned about the commercial stuff at this point. Although if a commercial entity wanted to come in, I would certainly welcome that conversation. Other thoughts? Ms. Evans? Um, yeah, I just thinking about what Trustee Hannon said. Um, I, um, I was just thinking that maybe that we could consider like loading zone space over there, just do some and do some signage and maybe consider some um, I don't know what is it like a four hour limit to park over there right now we could limit the hours just to just to encourage people to park across the street by the pool. Chief Weitzel do you do you have any off the top of your head thoughts about this? Yeah, there's been no study done of the parking that that's correct one of the trustees had mentioned that and we do have issues when the snow and even when the, the sled hill there is used, you know, we get usually get complaints that people are parking too far west down Burling because you can't see the markings on the roadway and they like to drop their kids off and sometimes they leave the cars there. Um, so I think it, uh, that was a good suggestion. I think we would have to look at the parking. And um, we used to have a loading zone on Quincy way back when there was a some businesses, I think it was a cleaning service right off of Quincy and Riverside. But I, I might have to be a little larger. I've noticed, at least my, from my personal experience, the one in Lyons, and maybe Chief Buckley might even know more than me, but when I go over there, a lot of the, the at least the canoes 
were being towed behind cars and they had to eat, they could very easily park in there because that was a forest preserve parking lot with a lot of space. So if you have, if they were actually putting the canoes behind them and not up on top of their cars, they usually bring like a trailer um, mm -hmm. to put those in. So they, they were taking up two spots when they were parking. Yeah, and I, I don't think they're gonna wanna park far away and drag the, the canoe from too far away. So we would have to make some considerations in the, in the parking logistics for sure. And just to round out, that sort of is my concern. And I think Chief Weitzel said it best, you know, you sort of make the analogy to, you know, the chaos when, when the sledding hill is active, but that coupled with, you know, many of these people may have a trailer and take up two spaces. And quite frankly, there's a, there's a finite number of, of spots on that street. You know, routinely they fill up with, with library traffic. So we're gonna add to that congestion. Um, you know, there's a pay lot right across the street, but you know, people tend not to wanna to pay to park. So I think it is something that, that someone's gonna to have to give more thought to um, or else, you know, every weekend will be a sledding hill type chaos situation um, that will definitely change the flow of, of the traffic in Riverside. But I, I, so maybe I'm, I'm obviously in the minority here. I, I, I just think that I don't think that we're going to have an, an onslaught of kayakers and canoers coming to town like the sledding hill. I mean, it's the same thing with the fishing discussion that we had a few years ago the fishermen that go down there and fish, there's not a thousand fishermen down there at once parking. I just think it's a little bit, but again, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's, it's just it's so a little bit over. Over speculating. Alex, yeah, can, we, I can just, I, cause I, I have a question and you're probably the right person to, to answer it. Um, so one, one question I guess I have in terms of the, the location is, is that a spot where people are going to want to launch a canoe? Because you know, I guess my impression of the canoers I see is that they start way upstream. Uh, and I think it's more likely that this location would be used to take a canoe out instead of put a canoe in. Trustee Gallagos, I know you're, you're an avid kayaker. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I would say this is not an end point for um, anyone traveling on the, on the water. I would say this is more of the midway point. So then take a break from you know wherever up north or they're coming downstream from, and they can stop by, have lunch at one of our restaurants, um, take a little nature walk, and then get back on the water. Um, this would certainly not be an endpoint. They would find much more accommodable parking at Stony Ford and Lyons, or even further downstream as well. This this would not be um, what other trustees have suggested as as high volume traffic. I mean, Alex, wouldn't this be a great spot if you launch further up the, the river to, you know, pull your kayak out and drop a, drop a line in, on your fishing pole and, catch, you know, sit there with your kid and catch a couple of fish or what? I mean, that's what, that's what I envision. That's, that's probably where I, I would envision as well. I don't, I don't see them coming in in droves. I don't see a dozen cars being parked there at any one given time. Um, but again, we'll have to look through the summer and see what it's like. And then, and then recalibrate at that point. Um, I just don't suspect that it's going to be a high volume. So going to, I mean, I, I agree with what you just said. So th that raises the question then, let's say, let's say you have two or three, you know, kayakers or canoes, you know, come in there and they want to either to, you know, go fishing or they want to run into town and go to saw millies or something. Where are they going to put them? They put them uh, on, on the grass. But I, I don't think there's- The whole idea of, of kayaks, you see the vibrant colors, is that they're easily spotable. I mean, these are 10, 12 feet. Um, I mean, someone can just go to them and have a huge van and try to steal them. But um, if you tie them together, that, that really is a theft deterrent. Um, so you're saying people would leave them in the river or they would pull them out and pull them across the path into the Swan Pond area? Onto the grassy area. Yeah, they, they don't leave them in the water because the water could, could have a flow that, um, you know, takes away their kayak. Um, but they would, they would pull them off and, and leave them on the grassy area until they come back down from, from their temporary visit. And are we okay with that? Yeah, that's pretty much what I expected. 
they'd pull out the they would pull out their kayak or their canoe and leave it in the lawn and then go for a walk hopefully to check out town it's no different than throwing your bike on the ground right i mean yeah. well now we have bike racks or will <laughs> But if it became a problem, we could get kayak racks as well. So I, I don't think it's something to worry about until it happens. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're all cool with this then? Yeah. Okay. I think it looks great. I'm excited. Yeah, I think it's 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 really a very nice addition to the project. I'm, I'm glad, Director, you, you you brought it up, Mr. Pollock. Yes, uh, assuming we're done with the issues of of financing mm -hmm. and. Um, and whether there's a, a kayak or canoe launch. Uh, I, I just had a comment about the, um, about the path itself. So I know that we talked the last time about that uh, impervious paver strip being an option if we had to do it. Um, but at this point, we've, uh, we have a number $30,000 would be the cost of that. I would like to suggest that at the very least, we include that in the bid, even if it's not required, that we include that in the bid document as an option. Because I think that the path will function and look much better with that strip down the middle. Uh, we're talking about 10 foot wide uh, concrete path, granted aggregate, exposed aggregate, nicer than just regular concrete, but it's still 10 foot wide. And I think that center line would be highly functional uh, to keep, you know, just as it is on a street. And I think it aesthetically, it would look tremendous uh, to break up the expanse of concrete. So I would like to suggest we at least include that as an option in the bid documents. And if it comes in at fifty thousand dollars maybe we don't do it if it comes in at 30 or 20 uh personally i think at 30 i would be inclined to want to include that in it whether it's impervious or not i would not care in fact i given that area impervious probably doesn't matter but uh, i like the idea of a strip down the middle of that 10 foot wide pathway uh, following up on that director tab can you talk a little bit, a bit about what kind of materials would be used for, for that kind of decorative strip and would, would it pose um, maintenance issues given the, the, the two different materials? Yeah, um, so I guess to start, you know, if the board chose to, we could definitely have that included as a line item in the bid for the project. Um, my first concern is, while I agree it would look good um, and of course, I would have to kind of gauge people's expectations, but if you know, our expectations are that this permeable paper brick strip is to remain weed free underneath the canopy of trees, um, you know, it's 2000 feet long. That's a, that's a whole lot of weeding to do uh, if that's what the expectations are. But, you know, if, if people are fine with weeds growing into joints of this thing, then uh, it's less of a maintenance. I don't, I don't think it makes any sense. To, to have a permeable strip. Uh, I think to Trustee Pollock's point, this would be purely an aesthetic thing. Um, so, you know, it could just, I guess what I'm curious about is the, is the combination of the, of the concrete and, and the bricks or pavers, you know, whatever it would be in terms of like freeze thaw cycles and things like that. Yeah, the bricks, you know, they'd be similar to the ones in lot one, um, you know, because they are permeable initially and will drain uh, throughout their life uh, to a certain extent. You know, the freeze thaw cycle should not be an issue for the bricks themselves. Uh, you know, they are breaking up uh, a 10 foot wide path. So because it's not a complete piece, you know, there might be uh, some shifting at some point, you know, that that area down there is susceptible to flooding, which you know, if it holds a bunch of water over a long period of time and we do catch a freeze while it's saturated, you might get some heaving and shifting and so forth, but that's with any sidewalk. Uh, you know, if the engineers feel that 
know, it's a valid option and something that is long-term. I don't see a, a big issue with it. Paula? Yeah, thank you, uh, President Sells, for bringing that up. I meant to start that discussion by asking what the structural and maintenance uh, pros and cons of that of that strip would be. And uh, and after hearing what Director Tab said, I think it probably is not a good idea to put that, whether it's pervious or impervious, strip down the middle. But maybe we can look at stamping or something to delineate the center line, um, if that's not a big added cost or something. But uh, now that I think about it, uh, and now that Director Tab has explained that, I think he's probably right that having a seepage in the middle of that path just is is asking for trouble. So uh, maybe maybe stamping or something to delineate the center line. But uh, otherwise, I I would withdraw my previous comments. Well, but I, I want to follow up on that because I was wondering the same thing. And, I, and again, I don't know how difficult something like this would be, but is there, it, would there be some way of, of, of having a stained center line? So it would, it would all still be exposed to aggregate, but we could maybe have like a brick kind of color something like that. Mr. Tab, do you want to, you just, uh, we're kind of just throwing things at you out of the blue. Do you want to, you want to investigate this and then, and get back to us at, at, a, at another meeting? Yeah. You know, the initial thought on the, the staining thing is, and I'm definitely not a cr uh, concrete expert, so don't hold me to this, but the stain is typically mixed in the blend of concrete. So you're doing multiple pours. Um, so you'd pour the center separate from the, the lanes, uh, and in essence, you're creating because you'd have to have concrete sidewalk joint, uh, colored pour joint concrete sidewalk. So you're incorporating two joints where typically you would have one. Not that it's a bad thing. It's just the labor is probably there's probably a, an additional cost to the labor and the dying process and so forth. But I can investigate. It. I could ask Orion um, what he thinks of it. Ms. Collins, you had something? I was just going to ask if, if we're talking about, would it be, when we're putting this out for bid, are they different types of contractors that do this different types of work? Are we, does this decision need to be made before we put it out to bid? I would say any concrete contractor has probably dealt with dying of concrete over the course of you know their existence. Uh, the stamping of exposed aggregate might be a little more difficult Honestly, I don't even know if it can be done just because the aggregate texture to it, the uh, the embossment of the stamp might get lost in the texture of the, the concrete itself. But the staining of it is probably something that can be done. I don't know the cost to it or how it would infect or affect the uh, you know the, the structural integrity of the, the path itself just because you might have to break it up as three separate pores. We can look into it though. I mean, personally, I would like to see this. I'd like to see some kind of rendering of what of what this would actually look like before we kind of go too far down this path, so to speak, um, in terms of you know how wide the strip would be, what it would look like. So um, why don't we why don't we set that that I mean I I I have to say I completely agree with with Trustee Pollock though from an aesthetic standpoint that it would it would be a much more attractive um, yeah. path with with that decorative element. So why don't we let Mr. Tab look into that and he can uh, get back to us at the next meeting or so. And then we can make decisions about the bid process. Does that sound like, does that work with you, Manager Francis? Okay. Yes. So anything else on this issue? Okay. Uh, we, anybody with a uh, new business this evening? No? So we don't have any need for an executive session this evening. So I would ask for a motion and a second to adjourn. So moved. By Mr. Gallegos. Second. Second by Ms. Evans. Please call the roll. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Gallegos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. I remember, I remember it at the last minute, Mr. Molina. <laughs> it's all yours.
And it's fine that we we do this inquiry and put it on the record after the meeting is adjourned. It's basically to check whether the meeting met all the standards under the OMA in past tense. So I'll go around to each of the elected officials and you know the drill. Um, the, the questions are, were you able to hear everything during this virtual meeting during the entire length of it? And do you, were you able to understand everything and participate fully? So that, that's the inquiry. We'll start with Trustee Gallagos. I saw and heard everything and participated as well. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Evans. Yes, I was able to hear and understand. Okay, and participate fully, correct? Yes. Which, which I observed, so. Uh, okay. Trustee, Trustee Pollock. Yes, I was, thank you. Thank you. Trustee Gisa. Yes, I was. Trustee Hammond. Uh, yes. Trustee Collins? Yes. President Sells? Yes. Thank you and good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Uh, night. Meeting is adjourned.